Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. He said before the tournament, I'm going to be top scorer in each innings of this World Cup. I just feel that too much was placed on him, too much emphasis on him. And when he went without scoring, that was a damaging blow to Bangladesh. Still, they can smile the supporters, but only because they're seeing themselves on the big screen, not because of the result. Soundtrack doesn't help either. Welcome to Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. And uh, this is the show where we rate the movies and TV shows that we're going to this watch either on the internet or so elsewhere. This is the show where we sit on our self appointed throne in some kind of pretend bunker and we proclaim. How many frames everything should get, whether it's thumbs up or thumbs 24 per second. And uh, we just tell everyone what they should think about TV, right? I uh, actually went to the trouble of uh, having a lackey appoint me to my throne so that well, it wouldn't good. technically be self-appointed. Oh, Although yeah. it was still self-aggrandizing. I, uh, I loaded up Broderbund's, the uh, print shop, and printed out a certificate on my dot matrix printer. That's, nice. That's, That's, a, good. That's a good idea. I'll have to do that, too. Right over um, there. Okay. No, uh, this is, we, we look into television, movies, uh, video of all kinds uh, with an internet perspective, with a tech perspective, and taking control of your entertainment in, like, in a way that was never possible, I don't know, even like five years ago. Uh, you know, you're right. It's, 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 it's a two-way street now because everyone's got kind of a – people, I think, have a literacy for uh, content creation, and that's for all of us, and that's something that the Internet's made possible. It was YouTube that really allowed us to discover that making movies could be as fun as watching movies. There and is I think, a, oh, we all armchair quarterback now. There is a battle going on, Brian Brushwood, a battle between the old guard that wants to control how you entertain yourself – and a new, unmeasured, unlimited garden of evil and fun. Now wait a minute! It sounds you like can, you're, you're I, saying you're saying. The, sorry, the, I, the I, I started. To, I started to get lost in, in the poet, poetry of it. Uh, no, yeah. this is this is a battle between like you know what? In the old days, you had to wait for somebody to make something and had, had it set down the pike. And what we're seeing is a revolution going on where slowly, and this is what we're covering on frame rate. Slowly, people are saying, "Hey, wait a minute." I can make stuff and distribute it myself. And there's a huge tension and battle going on over that. Well, and that ties in directly to today's big story. This just in, the big story. 50 years ago, the chairman of the FCC, Newton Minow, uh, who, by the way, did you know this before you read this article, uh, that they named the Minnow in Gilligan's Island after him? I I did not, and yeah. I also did not know that he wore it as a badge of honor because I guess what happened was is he got up in front of the FCC, and that's where he gave – this is where the vast wasteland phrase, referring to television as a, a vast wasteland, comes from, is one speech the guy gave. I never knew this, uh, and uh, including stuff like, you know, Gilligan's Island. He, he asked people – and I'm going to quote here. I invite each of you to sit down in front of your television when your station goes on the air and stay there for a day without a book. Without a magazine, without a newspaper, without a profit and loss sheet or a rating book to distract you, keep your eyes glued to that set until the station signs off. I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. And he was talking about the kind of content like what later became, you know, Gilligan's Island. And, and I guess uh, Sherwood Schwartz, who was apparently there, 
to watch the speech uh, didn't cotton to that very well, and so named it the SS Minnow in honor of the jerk who said that television was a vast wasteland. So whenever you hear that phrase, like, well, TV, you know TV, it's vast wasteland, they're quoting, whether they know it or not, FCC Commissioner Newton Minnow, uh, in the latest Atlantic Monthly, Minnow looks back on the past 50 years since he gave that speech and says... For 50 years, we have bombarded our children with commercials disguised as programs and with endless displays of violence and sexual exploitation. We are nearly alone in the democratic world in not providing our candidates with public service television time. Instead, we make them buy it, and so money consumes and corrupts our political discourse. So it seems like in the past 50 years, he hasn't really changed his mind at all. No, no. But, and you know, that's that's not a bad point about uh, money corrupting. And uh, but, but I mean, I don't even know if it's true anymore. I think if the candidates wanted, we could have a debate and the candidates could refuse to, you know, uh, I don't know. I guess, I guess putting out your message, you do have to buy advertisement time if you want to go out to them and interrupt their television watching experience. And I can't see commercials, that right? There's the debates are free, but but actual commercials in the United States are not free. You have to pay for that, that airtime to get your commercial shown on television. So we should point out that what we're talking about is an article in, uh, on ARS. Do you say ARS Technica or Ars Technica? Oh, well, where, the article that Minnow wrote was in Atlantic Month, Monthly, but uh, there was an article on Ars Technica talking about this written by Matthew Lazar. And uh, Lazar says that he does not believe television is not a vast, is a va a vast wasteland anymore. He believes it's a crazy, weed-filled, wonderful, out-of-control garden. Well, and that was the part that I didn't like out of this whole article. I think he had a lot of really good points. I think clearly he's got a love of television as and somebody who grew up in the new media. But I don't like the idea of it being a crazy weed-filled garden because garden implies that it's somebody's job to curate it and to make sure it but is what it is. But it's weed-filled. It, it, well, exactly. And what I want is to think of it as a jungle, a rainforest, where it's dangerous and it's it's precipitous, it's it's insane. But in there are is magic. You know, somewhere in there is the cure for cancer if you can find it. And medicine. I, I think you, if I, if I can uh, if I can split the difference between what you're saying and, and what Lazar said, uh, what we want is a park. You know, uh, in other words, there's rangers there to warn you about the bears. And there's a there's a road to a lodge where you can get oriented, and then after that you're on your own and it's wild, and you can find all the cool stuff that's out in the wild. You know so what? when I'm I say a park, I don't mean like a city park. I mean like a like a national park, like a wildlife reserve kind of park. Well, and that's kind of, that's kind of what we have with YouTube, where there are a few ground rules. Now I, I'll tell you, and and this is one of the things uh, to, to splinter off here. It's it's great in that there are certain things you know for sure you will never see on YouTube. You will never see. You know, uh, you know, full on sex or or pornographic material or anything like that. But then, of course, they have no way to really control language without everything going to crap. And I wonder how long it'll be before YouTube starts having some kind of rating experience, some voluntary tagged rating, because I would love it if I could let my seven year old just watch whatever she wants on YouTube, as long as, you know, it, it was within a certain gradient where, where it's yeah, like, she yeah, yeah. She would never hear the f bomb or or the s bomb or or whatever. Um, you know, because they or, already have they 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 kick out any porn, any nudity gets kicked off of YouTube, and they, any copyright violations, as we know on frame rate, gets kicked right. out uh, on YouTube, whether it's actually fair use or not. Uh, and and so they they have a little bit of a system there, but it's all or nothing, right? If they right. if there's f, like you say, if there's bad language, it's in there, and there's and there's no way to filter against it. Well, and it's it was especially frustrating because there was a time that she went through, and I don't know if they're still on there now, but at some point, everybody had posted every single of the old Spider-Man series from the 1960s, and she loved it. She just wanted to click, and it was the kind of thing I could leave her in the room, and she could it would end, and she'd click on part two of three, and then part three of three, and then she'd pick a different one and keep on going. But when there was nobody to guide her, there were so many parodies that it's like, you know, crazy Spider-Man video, he curses a lot. And it's like, so I'm right. in the other and I hear, I was like, ah, son of a, you know, because I don't want to have to sit there and, and then you come running into the room cursing, making exactly. the problem worse. I'm like, son of a bitch, <laughs> turn off that effing blanket. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but back to the question of whether it's, whether it's a, you know, beautiful garden or a crazy jungle or whatever, uh, certainly the landscape has changed uh, vastly since the vast, lace went, vast wasteland comment. Uh, some people would say it's a much vaster wasteland. Uh, because we do have an appallingly large amount of crap out there now. But uh, what would you say is the biggest difference between the landscape now and, I guess, 50 years ago? Well, 50 years ago, you had four channels, uh, usually, in your local area. 
and I'm not counting the Dumont network, which which went down after like a couple of years in the 50s. But you usually had an independent channel uh, in an area in addition to ABC, CBS, and NBC. Uh, so so you you had four choices, maybe five in larger areas, maybe even six. But th that was it, and I when, and that was all of your channels. So there were some benefits to that, right? You know, the right. news had to be accurate and had to be on point, and it couldn't be subjective because you that was it. That were the only channels, right? So so they took it very seriously. Now we have this vast array, even if you don't count the Internet, right? You have this vast array of channels, and so you get MSNBC with their biased coverage, their avowedly biased coverage, and you get Fox News with their coverage that's slanted in the in their avowed way, and you're you're able to get away with that because you can say, look, there's tons of choices. You can go to CNN, you can go to MSNBC, you can go to ABC. You know, there's lots of different ways. So in a way, we have more viewpoints represented, but there's a there's a cost to this because. Everybody still wants to have that massive model. They still want to be able to charge those amazing rates that the broadcast networks were able to charge when they were the only games in town, right? When right. they were splitting up that 100 million person audience amongst three of them. And that's just never going to happen. Those broadcast networks still have a lion's share of the ratings, though. So the cable networks are all looking to start with a niche and move to broadening. And you see it happen over and over again. MTV is the classic example everyone uses. It started with videos, then it turned into shows. And sci-fi is doing it right now. They're abandoning the science fiction fantasy roots and moving into wrestling and moving into collecting and reality shows. And the reason they're doing it is they want to widen that audience. They want to get the bigger audience. It happened with the Nashville network. It happened with uh, you know pretty much the TLC network. That's the path that this model encourages, which means we'll never get a niche network that continues to serve its niche and super serve it throughout its lifetime. It was happening at Tech TV before Tech TV got subsumed by Comcast. They were trying to broaden out, and they were adding shows that weren't specifically about what the core audience cared about. So well, I think the Internet is going to allow niche networks to survive as niche networks because the competition is immense and 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 it, it doesn't make sense to try to broaden out because you have too many competitors who are eating away at that pie man i i don't know uh because there would be there it, it's weird because obviously we're here at the twit network and of course we're in the we are in the bit, middle of the jungle of the internet and of and twit uh, of course has made a name for itself as being a very tech heavy network and and also commentary heavy uh, we here at frame rate are very commentary heavy, but there might be some people questioning whether or not if if, if we're part of the sci-fiization of Twit. I mean, what would you say to that? Yeah, no, it, it's a good point, right? And it's actually a point that Leo and I have discussed, which is how do we how do we uh, serve that audience and still broaden the types of content that they want without broadening away from their tastes? It's a subtle right. difference. So well, and, if, and they, if, you're, if you're looking at this saying, you know what, I know this audience really likes tech. What other ways can we do tech? Frame rate is an example of that. We're saying, hey, you know what, uh, people like videos. They like television and videos, and they still like tech, so let's do it from their perspective. And that's where I think we get it right. Something like Current Geek that Scott Johnson and I were doing, we said, well, let's go outside of tech and do just the geek mindset. Uh, there's still an argument to be made there, but that was less successful because it didn't speak to that, that direct you know, niche. But what we've never done on Twit, even with NSFW show, which I know you're probably in the back of your mind thinking a little bit about, uh, we've never well, well, said, NSFW let's go totally, you know, let's go totally away from the mainstream and try to grab audience out on the edges, people who aren't interested in what we're talking about. Right, right. Well, and, and even NSFW was was trying to do essentially what we're doing on on frame rate, which is, you know, it, it, you know, what else are geeks into? What do we do all day? We forward around ridiculous viral video of people doing goofy things. And, exactly. Uh, you know, exactly. You know, and so we're we're trying to speak to the culture. Now, the question is, would um, uh, the reason that sci fi sci fi gets a certain amount of market share? And I guess the idea is 
They change their programming hoping to grow or to keep the viewers they already have watching longer. No, so it's like they, they, hey, they want to grow to another channel. They want to grow. Uh, okay. I, I know. I know this very intimately. You look at that. You look at those <laughs> top Trust shows. Me, Brian, I know this very, very well. <laughs> you look at those top two shows and you say, yeah, those are getting pretty good ratings. We'd really like bigger ratings, though. Um, and so. Instead of expanding those shows and try to get those people to watch longer, I think we I think we've probably maxed them out. There's probably the most people who are ever going to watch Call for Help in the Screen. I mean, who are ever going to watch those two top-rated shows <laughs> that we have. So, so, so what we need to do is bring on some other shows that'll get people to watch who wouldn't sample the network. Maybe a couple of them will stick around with your top-rated shows, but but we'll build that audience out and come up with new hits that are more massively popular, and we'll we'll build on this audience. Well, and it certainly has worked very well for a number of other uh, – I've, I've been to a number of, of television pitches, and one guy, uh, uh, David, over at Indigo Films, had a really good point. Uh, because uh, when you go to a pitch, you have a certain topic or an idea. They're like, oh, well, that's not our brand. That's not our brand. Uh, David and, Frank? And David, David said, uh, look, the most successful shows on just about every network are always off-brand. When I say National Geographic, you don't think – a show about teaching dogs how to behave themselves. You don't think the dog whisperer. When, when, uh, you know, when you, we say Discovery, Mythbusters has come to define Discovery, but Discovery's brand used to be documentary filmmaking, not blowing stuff up for grins. Uh, and uh, I, he had a couple of other examples as well. But go through and look at what the most popular show, uh, Chris Angel's Mind Freak on A&E. I mean, look at, look, I mean, A&E is, uh, you know, was, was Night at the Improv and hoity-toity stuff. And all of a sudden, it's a it's a, it's a guy wearing you know black eyeliner running around doing tricks on the strip. Or, or let, hey, here's an even better example because it's one where we actually like the way they've changed it. AMC is not American movie classics. It's Mad Absol Men. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it totally. Uh, History Channel uh, is a show you know used to be the Hitler Channel, and then and then you got Pawn Star showing up out of nowhere. Uh, so yeah, uh, it, it'll be interesting to watch how networks in the internet space in this vaster jungle g reach their their adolescence uh, of uh you know maturity i guess all right uh i believe we have one other big story right oh, rather another big story <laughs> stop everything it's another big story I don't know how they got this to happen but in a little over 2 months time a horror movie called the tunnel will receive its world premiere on BitTorrent for free. And it's not okay, just I'm a not movie made by people in their, in their gardens or their garages. That, that, this is a movie put out by Hollywood giant Paramount Pictures. That's the surprising part because the first part of the story in that, in that FARC headline variety, you know, not news, movie gets released to, uh, to the internet on torrents. Uh, news, it's, uh, it's by P Paramount. I mean, that's amazing to me. Now, it looked to me, from what I saw, I only poked around at this. I don't know if you read uh, the, the full story or, or looked at the website, but it looked like there will be multiple parts. No, no, I guess, no I'm thinking of another story later on down the road. Um, what, where do you think Paramount's going with this? Well, I, you know what I think it is, is these guys uh, got to deal with Paramount to make this movie. It, it's based on these tunnels that were built under Sydney, Australia for a mass transit system that was never implemented. Uh, so it's a little bit of a Blair Witch kind of movie, right? It's like, what's really happening down there in those tunnels? And Paramount said, yeah, that's great. We're not going to distribute it, but we'll do it straight to DVD. And these guys said, look, when you go straight to DVD, here are your sales. They're, they're at a certain level. Now, we know that when movies that are not blockbusters go on BitTorrent, the DVD sales go up. So if you're right. going to make us do this deal straight to DVD, we want you to agree to allow us, the copyright holders, to put this out for free on BitTorrent because we are gambling that that will increase the sales of the DVDs. And somebody at Paramount had the light bulb in their head enough to go, yeah, what do we got to lose? You know, hey, what? You know what? This is not going to make that much money. Uh, so even if we don't make all this money in this deal, let's try it. Let's see what happens. So this is this is the halo effect of these are the echoes of Radiohead releasing in rainbows for whatever you wanted to pay for it. When you do something, and you're especially if you're first, and that's why we're talking about it on frame rate, and that's why everybody who downloads it, there are people who are like morally into BitTorrent, like it's a way of life for them. And if you could capture them and create. 10,000 evangelists 
who are essentially like they're paid to go out and tell everyone how great this movie is and how awesome the people are for releasing it straight to BitTorrent. Now they're paid in free viewings of the show, but I but when they go out and they get everybody engaged, if they get their mother-in-law to 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 want to watch it, she's not going to buy it or you know she's not going to watch it downloading on BitTorrent because she's not that kind of person. She's going to buy the DVD and when people give a gift they're not going to give a crappy, burned-out copy of the of the movie that they love so much. They're going to buy an actual copy of the movie. So it's it's a percentages game, and I think it's a brilliant marketing ploy. And I hope that this is as successful as the In Rainbows experiment, so that more and more people start thinking about uh, clever ways to to not try to fight the the trappings of piracy and instead fight piracy itself. I have one little criticism of the model that you put forward there because it's a and the reason I criticize it is because the movie industry has usually criticized what you just said in this way, which is to say, yes, but eventually DVD sales continue to go down. We have to be able to sell online. Therefore we need DRM. Therefore we need to sue people who give away free versions of our movies unauthorized out of existence. And therefore they would never want to usually have this kind of situation where they give something away free for BitTorrent in other in order to sell it on DVD. But I think the answer to that is it's not just about mom who doesn't know how to use the computer and wants to buy the DVD or dad. Right. Uh, it's about awareness. It's about people talking about it. So there's somebody out there on a forum or on Twitter who starts saying, yeah, I got this off BitTorrent, the tunnel. It's amazing. You've got to see this. And somebody else says, yeah, I know about BitTorrent, but I really don't know how to use it. Uh, you know, somebody showed me a, a, a way to download stuff, but I, if I can get it, I can get it on DVD. Well, I'll just, I'll just do that. I'll just order it off of Amazon. So it's what? not, it's not about the, the like computer savviness of it. It's about the, the awareness, raising awareness about the movie and then having people say, well, what's the easiest way to get this? Yeah, I guess I could go on BitTorrent and get it. But if Amazon has it on DVD, that's, that's to me, that's easier. And I don't right. need to see it the second. Yeah, and you're talking to somebody who's a, a recovering BitTorrent-aholic himself. You know, there was a time where it's like, well, I'm going to grab it. Well, I'm not going to pay for it. And what was funny is looking back on it on those times, I think the thing, the reason I would go to BitTorrent was not because I didn't want to pay for it because it's like, you know, it's 10 bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. It was that I wanted it right this minute and I wanted it as easy as possible. And if you you can court away more pirates with a system that prices movies correctly and gets them uh, distribution as, as easy as possible. I mean, it's amazing to me the transformation as far as going legit over the last six years that I've seen as a result of people doing experiments that make it available to where it's just not fun or easy to do the to do the piracy thing. Yeah, and that's the last piece of the puzzle, right? Eventually, if this model works, it's not just that it's released on physical DVD, because I think you still do that. I think you still release physical copies for collectors, for people who want to have it. Because even as that number goes down, I don't think it ever hits zero. But you also make it available on iTunes. You make it available on Netflix Instant Streaming. You make it available on Hulu. So that there is no reason not to watch it legitimately. And you give it away on BitTorrent, to, to get some buzz around amongst a community. But then when it comes to the masses, they go, oh, well, I already subscribed to Netflix. It's on Netflix streaming? Well, I'll just do it that way. Why mess around with BitTorrent? Then this works brilliantly. The, the reason this is not scientific, though, is because we're talking about it. And so one of, the, one of the things that spikes the test, right, is the fact that, well, because it's Paramount Pictures releasing something without DRM on BitTorrent, everybody's going to talk about the tunnel. And right. it's, it's getting all of that word of mouth already without and having it built naturally. I guarantee that's the part of the calculus that was in whatever executive's mind when he decided to authorize this. It's a case where it's like, look, we're not going to make a lot of money from this. We could do something nutty. It won't bind us. It won't be an implicit uh, agreement. It'll be, an, you know, we could call it an experiment, whatever it is you want. But it's going to get the whole world talking about this movie, and it will cost us nothing. You know what? And so I, you know, even even if that's all it is, is a publicity gimmick, still hats off to Paramount for trying this noble experiment. I I I wonder if some some savvy executive looked at this and said, "Well, wait a minute. I've got a marketing budget that's this much, and if 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 I look at the BitTorrent and I'm really honest about how much money we'd really lose from people downloading BitTorrent instead of buying the DVD, that's less than my marketing budget." Boom. Right. Get rid of the marketing budget. Don't spend any money on advertising. Do this. All my marketing is done, and I've actually saved money. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. And Let's I say, I, I'll be curious. I'd love to do a schedule a follow up on this on frame rate where we find out how much money it actually makes a few yeah, months. Yeah, let's try now. to remember to do that. On to film film. Tonight on Film Foul, The Hobbit, Barbarians, and Zack Snyder. You didn't use the voice. You didn't do the uh, the dulcet tones of the Film Foul theme. I did it. I just did. I did it tonight on. Oh, okay. Hey, do you know that when I was working at Universal Orlando for their um, uh, Halloween Horror Nights, uh, two of the last years I did it, one of the guys who was out in front barking for me, he's this old guy in his late 70s. By, by and, barking, everyone, he means a barker who like, hey, come on in, see the show, not, not like barking like a dog. Right, correct, correct. Just in case there was any confusion yeah. for the one old lady who somehow was watching <laughs> Brain Raid who didn't understand what I was talking about. I'm glad you cleared that up for me. It's not just the old lady. It's the troll in the chat room. He's like, what do you mean, barking like a dog? Mm -hmm. This guy, this guy uh, his name is Don, and he's amazing. It turns out he did the vast majority of all the, I think it was CBS or ABC announcements you heard in the late 70s. So I'm talking to this guy, oh. and he, he's, he's been retired forever, and he, he loves Universal, and he loves hanging out, and he loved my show. Uh, and and I, I was like, I would go up to him, and I'm like, do it, do it. And he, <laughs> and, and he would be like, coming up, on your, what was it? Uh, coming up after Nightline and your local news. And it was just like, you could hear his voice, and all of a sudden, That's I'm five amazing. years old, and I'm up later than I'm supposed to be. It was amazing, dude. We got, could, you, could you possibly get him to record stuff for us? Yeah, that's oh. exactly what I was thinking. Holy crap, I got to track him down. And I know we have fans of the show who know the people at, at Universal. Um, Don, yeah, no, Don that would be, would be crazy. I, I will try to track down Don and get him to record. And, and I'll, I'll tell you what, right now, anyone who has suggestions for what we would like Don to record, hit me up at uh, frameratenshow at gmail.com. Coming just, up next on Framerate, Film Foul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, we'll we'll pick a few of those for him for him to do. That would be amazing. I can't believe I'd ever even thought about that. Oh yeah, that that's that's freaking awesome. All right. Uh, anyway, into the film film stories. Uh, Zack Snyder, the uh, director of the next Superman, uh, hints that there will be a character in the next movie that many people will recognize as Superman. Now, was he just being funny, or did he mean like we're gonna see Bizarro Superman or something? Now, wait a minute. He's talking about a character that will be in Superman that you will recognize as Superman? Yeah, he's talking about the movie, right? He's like, there'll be a lot of people in this, or a lot of, uh, there'll be a character in this movie a lot of people will recognize as Superman. Now, was he just being flippant? Because everybody's going crazy and saying, that, what that means, that means that Bizarro Superman's going to be there. Or he's talking about Zod, because Zod has the same powers as Superman. And they, even though he said that, here's the, here's the exact quote. There could be a character in the movie that other people might refer to as Superman. Oh, no, he's definitely being flip. He's not. He's not. Because this is other uh, people, though. Well, he is. He is what? He's responding to a question in, in, in an interview, right? This is not, yeah. not the kind of prepared speech or statement he's given, right? Yeah, it's an interview, I think, right? I, I think that would be way too clever for him to just have off the cuff uh, if he is trying to hint that it's going to be a bizarro superman but even then um you know like like let's say let's say for example they found some digital footage of uh, christopher reeve and they made oh, a like a cameo and, exactly huh. and then you could say you know well there'll be one character in there that some people would refer to as superman then that makes sense. I, I or, don't think it's <laughs> we watch it. It's freaking Tom Welling from Smallville. <laughs> oh. you know, yeah, that, I think that's. I think that's the. Oh, I, I see. That's what I'm gonna say. That's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> all right. Hey, we should take the spoiler alert up to up to yellow, because as we always do, we should take the spoiler alert up after we give a spoiler. Ah, it's not playing. What's I'm the? What, it. I'm it. What's the spoiler that we gave just now? Yeah, well, maybe. just that we're conjecturing about. You know, we're we're. Well, but we're, we'd have to actually know for it to be a spoiler, wouldn't he? Wouldn't that's I, true. I, we're just guessing. I'm, I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna say that even guessing. Is a spoiler no. because no. I'm guessing can't be a spoiler. 
it totally affects your viewing experience because you're like, well, I want to see if he's right. And meanwhile, you're thinking down this track that's not necessarily what the movie meant for you to be experiencing. I think a that's stretching the definition of yeah. spoiler way too Our, far. A spoiler's you, only a spoiler, a spoiler if always, you know. Exactly. Yeah. You have to actually be spoiling something, not saying yeah. like, oh, well, so like I think a song of ice and fire is going to have a wombat in it. Oh, you've spoiled I, it. Well, okay, so like if I was the director and I directly said that there'll be a character in my movie that some oh, people... Oh, you're talking about what he Superman. said as a spoiler. Um, Yeah, no, I, 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 okay, I get where you're coming from. It's yeah, a, we're debating whether or not it's a real spoiler or non-spoiler, which means the spoiler alert should be at yellow. Oh, boy, okay. So is what is what Zack Snyder saying a spoiler? Yeah, that's the as the director. All right, right. right. okay. I see what you're you now. talked me off the cliff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm, yeah, I think what I talked you into was not pushing me off the cliff. You talked me off the cliff where I was about to push you over. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, all right, uh, Conan the Barbarian getting a remake. Um, this feels wrong. And there's a uh, trailer for the new movie out. Uh, and, and actually, uh, All Things D's Boomtown, uh, Kara Swisher's blog, uh, they they put it up right next to the Arnold Schwarzenegger one to say, which one do you like better? Uh, we're not going to play both of them, but should we play a little bit of the of the new trailer? I just want to see a little bit of the visuals. All right, let's see, let's see what it looks like. I'm familiar with the imagery of the old one. This is coming off the Boomtown blog where she has yeah, it embedded. It was until I clicked it and then it... It looks like Harry Potter so far. This summer, enter the world in a world of the barbarian. Yeah. You are a knight. You are not even noble. I care not. I live. I love, I slay, and I'm content. Content, the barbarian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're not showing me enough of the movie to tell. And that, well, that could be just see. because they haven't finished, you know, enough of the principal photography, or it could be because they're worried about how it looks. Well, and, and I also, I mean, when I think of Conan the Barbarian, I think of larger-than-life imagery and over-the-top, and uh, and I'm not she, seeing any of that. Play, you know, play a little bit of the original trailer yeah. since, bring since, back, since bring we've back got it right there. HBO, let's let's take a look at this and see just uh, just how it compares. Presented by movie-list.com. Yeah, yeah, look at that! This guy's got to kill something! Yeah. This is making me want to watch this again. <laughs> All I know is that asses are being Conan. I don't want to see Conan wreathed in smoke hidden from me. I want to see him out kicking some ass like Arnold about, is here. Talking about how content he is? Yeah, on, I'm, I'm content. You know, I'm doing okay. For his brains? I just love do a little his battle. Muscles, his ruthless killing spree. The love. You know, I'm all right. Don't yeah, worry no, about look, me. You, you, know, got, you got a lot of work, Conan. Redux to win me over as Cohen and old schools rocking it with the ladies and the killing. Now, for this next story, um, I uh, I need to uh, find out if Zadiva is still in business. We should we should revisit that. But uh, earlier last week, uh, Engadget reported that Zadiva was starting a service where you would pay a buck ninety nine and get a four hour window in which to have a DVD streamed to you over the internet. Dude, sounds awesome. Sign me up, bro. Yeah. So wrap your head around that. They're not streaming a video to you the way Netflix is. They're actually playing a DVD and streaming it to you. So they say they don't need authorization from the movie industry. Because well, you it's me. just like renting a DVD instead of renting you just the DVD and the DVD player, which some rental, you know, Blockbuster will rent you a DVD player sometimes. They're saying, we'll just... You, you're renting the the piece at our at our business, and then we wait, send wait you minute, the video minute. to your computer. Wait a minute. So they're saying they're, they're doing this without authorization or agreements yes. with any of the studios? Exactly. Oh, I give it 20 minutes, man, because I guarantee you. Yeah, you know what? Brian Brushwood offers a competing service where I will play any of the DVDs in my library for you over Skype. You send me $20, I will go but, downstairs. But now, right now, now, here's the thing. Just for you. 
Okay, so so if you streamed it right now for you know our thousands of people watching, that would right. be a, a clear copyright violation, right? But you're saying you pay me a dollar ninety nine, I will stream it just to you. Nobody else can see it, so you are limiting the audience. You're not broadcasting, and they have let's say they have five copies of Conan the Barbarian. Once five people have rented it, it's it's out. They can't stream more because they are physically playing the DVDs. That's their yeah, defense. Uh, this sounds suspiciously close to a library, which sounds suspiciously close to communism, which sounds suspiciously like this will be shut down in the next 20 minutes. Uh, you know what? It's, it's, the site is still up. They're listing their registration as temporarily full, probably because they can't handle the number of people who want to do this. But did, did I already, and forgive me if we already talked about this on frame rate, but back when I was sick a couple months ago, there was a guy who just sent out a tweet saying, hey man, I'm going to watch this Apollo, uh, Apollo documentary on NASA. Uh, you want to watch with me? And he gave a Ustream thing. And I felt naughty clicking on it, but it's, it's three in the morning but and there were five people. broadcast. Yeah, no, it definitely was. But, I, I, and as, as, as I mentioned before, it felt more like a 21st century version of five guys hanging out watching yeah. a movie together. Right. And it's like, I wonder, we got we to fix the rules on this. And I wonder if the recent Facebook announcement, uh, let's say, okay, so if movies start rocking on Facebook and people start no, watching. Yeah, we were talking about this in relation to the Facebook thing with Dark right. Knight. How yeah. long until they start offering a party mode where you and your friends yeah. chat? They already do that on Xbox. Movie together. What's that? They already do that on Xbox. And with some uh -huh. Blu-ray players as well. You Wait, can you can you can watch a movie where everybody watches the same thing yeah. at the exact same time. And together? then you chat along while you're watching it. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, Why and blue, but with this? blu ray players, a lot of times if everybody has the Blu-ray, there's a party mode that you can use. Everybody has to have that Blu-ray, and everybody has to have the Blu-ray player right, no, that no, supports no, no, it. Totally but that it still mode. does it. Yeah. No, the whole purpose of a party mode is to expose people who normally wouldn't have seen this content. You're there at the party. Three of the five people there want to watch this movie. They all say they love it. Fine, I'll watch it. I'll go with the crowd. Now, here's the thing. With the Xbox all. one, as I understand it, now, I may, I may be mistaken about this, but as I understand it, everybody has to pay the rental fee. You okay. Can, you well, can't rent it and share it with a bunch of people. Yeah, okay. That's that's also dumb because that's not what you do when you do it physically. And 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 look, I, and you know what? Actually, it's not dumb if they just lower the price so low. Like, if it's a buck each, yeah, oh, I'll join the party. Heck, let's get... 5,000 people to join the party, and everyone kicks in a buck. Now you made $5,000. Yeah, but that, now you've broadcast. That's, I, 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 we're, we're, getting a, we're getting away from Zadiva now, which is, which is it's a whole different issue. Zadiva, Zadiva's not doing broadcast. They're not saying party mode. They're not saying any of that. You're just, I know you're just saying, like, you kind of want that, and that's true. But, but Zadiva, what Zadiva's doing is saying, we have a DVD. We stream it directly to you. We don't care how many people are in the room with you, but it only goes to you on your screen, and then it's legal. The, the problem is a hotel tried to do this a while ago, saying we're going to keep the DVDs down in a basement, and then if someone rents it, we'll just stream it up to their television, and, and then, you know, we don't have to pay for this pay-per-view system. Of course, pay-per-view systems in hotels make bank for, movie, for the movie industry, so they sued that hotel into oblivion. They well, said you cannot do that. That is an improper reuse of that DVD. Well, and here's the reason, the, out of everything you said, the, the flag words that tell me that this thing's definitely going to get shut down are, it's pretty much the same as, and it's like, I agree. When mp3.com in the late 90s came up with this brilliant scheme, they say, look, you got all these physical albums. It would take forever for you to encode them. Just put, just put your CD in the drive. Send us the Red Book audio key. We know you have the disc now, and we'll unlock this album that we've already encoded in MP3 format. So it's just like you encoded your own music and are listening to it yourself. And uh, they said, you know what? That may be what it's just like, but it's not because you are definitely distributing illegal MP3s. Well, and, and, the, and, and, the, and this is where Zadiva is very interesting, right? The problem with that was you were making copies, and there were unauthorized copies. No, you so, well. So, okay, so well. in other words, you weren't making the copy, but they had made a copy. And actually, somebody emailed me today and said, "Hey, I'm having a, I'm having an argument with a friend of mine over whether downloading MP3 versions of LPs you own is illegal." To he says it's legal because he owns the LP, and I'm like, "No, it's not. Yeah, it's an illegal copy. You can. It's actually questionable. The MP, the RIAA says that they don't think it's legal for you to make a backup of that LP, but even then." You making a backup of an LP is much different than you downloading an unauthorized copy. In the eyes of the law, all of those copies are different. 
and they all require a fair use defense. And if you downloaded them from somewhere else, you didn't make a fair use copy. So with, with MP3, what they ran afoul of is that part of the law that said, hey, those copies aren't the right copies, you know, so, so they're illegal. But what they're doing here is not making any copies. They're streaming the video. They're not distributing the video. But, but they're just is, displaying it. It is an illegal broadcast for one, though. It's an unauthorized eh, broadcast. Yeah, that's a question of whether you can broadcast to but one person. If you're well, saying, look, I mean, it doesn't go to anybody else. Yeah, I mean, it's like, look, anyone who, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a good question. And it, I, look, I mean, you know me, I'm on the side of more freedom for everyone all the no, way around. I know. But the powers that be, I think, are going to shut this thing down. And I, you know, fight the good fight and uh, and and you you rock out with your kooky DVD playing so. Yeah, I think they're going to get shut down, too. I'm just, you know. <laughs> all this has been nothing but devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Den of Geek uh, has a great article about 10 potentially great sci-fi movies coming in 2011. Uh, Apollo 18 is the J.J. Abrams movie uh, we've discussed oh before where a, a secret 18th Apollo mission lands on the moon, and we find out why we never went back. I think that's great. Uh, Attack the Block has, um, uh, oh, which I just saw Paul last night. So, and I didn't even recognize Nick Frost uh, in this photo here. Uh, but, um, yeah, Nick Frost on Attack the Block and a Cowboys and Aliens, I'm super, super excited about. Ridiculously yeah. upside down backwards excited what about. The, what the, it's Harrison Ford, Daniel Craig, Sam Rockwell, Olivia Wilde. Like, it's an amazing cast. Uh, Plus, did you John just Favreau there's directing. Cowboys and Aliens in the movie. Yeah, you can actually just stop right there, can't you? <laughs> Uh, we've talked about Super 8. It's coming August 19th. Uh, Real Steel, starring Hugh Jackman, October 7th, feature a length adaptation of a Twilight Zone episode. I did not know anything about this movie and, and had never heard about it. And then, But reading the synopsis, it sounds great. I had never seen the original Twilight Zone, but basically we're looking at a real-life boxer who trains robots to fight in the ring, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could stop right there. I'm sold. <laughs> All these movies look great. Uh, October 21st, Contagion, uh, Steven Soderbergh thriller, uh, sees Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow. Wait, wait, wait. Stay with us. Uh, Marion Cotillard, Kate Winslet, Jude Law, Lawrence Fishburne, and Elliot Gould dealing with a deadly any virus. Big stars, though. Any, it's any it's big a stars? horror. It's an Andromeda Strain type movie. So I'm I'm already in. I love that kind of stuff. What, one of the things they mentioned in the article is it seems like the, the contagious virus theme comes back once a decade or so. Uh, and he mentioned specifically Outbreak or the Andromeda Strain. Uh, which do you think has held up better over the years? Outbreak in the mid-90s or Andromeda Strain in the early 70s? I almost have to say Andromeda Strain. Really? Yeah. No, I, 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 maybe I'll have to go back and watch Outbreak again. But I thought Outbreak was really good. Maybe because... Uh, I had read it. I had read The Stand maybe four or five years beforehand. Yeah. And, and I just so finished reading The Stand. The Stand experience. I just finished reading The Stand. So that's all I can oh, think about wow. when I think about virus outbreaks. Did you did you find an audiobook version of it? No, there was no. I, well, there are audiobook versions, but not legitimately obtained uh, unless yeah. you pay over like thirty dollars to buy them used CDs, which I was like, no, that just doesn't work for me. So I just read it on Kindle. Right, right on. Uh, remake of The Thing coming October fourteenth. I'm of mixed emotions on this one because yeah. I have such a fond association with the original, and I just don't know if they're going to be able to nail it on this. Olivia Wilde comes back with Justin Timberlake in uh, something called Now, a dystopian tale about a future where scientists have found a way to cancel the aging process. It's kind of the reverse Logan's run. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's very Logan's run in that when you reach a certain age and you can't afford to make your payments... They, uh, they, they revoke your life privileges. Well, yeah, you have, to, you have to purchase an extended life lease, and if you can't afford it, then you're all Logan's run. Right. Uh, Rise of the Apes is, uh, do you realize it's been, and they point this out in the article, a decade since Tim Burton did his version of Planet of the Apes. Did you hate it as much as everyone else did? Oh, man, and I even like Mark Wahlberg, but man, that was just a disappointment. I don't know. I, there were, it was disappointing at times, but I mean, maybe because I saw it at the Alamo Draft House, I, I had a good enough time. To you had it. enough I, shiner in you to enjoy it, I'm thinking. I know, that's what it was. I was corrupted. <laughs> they were campaigning for me to love the movie with my pleasure centers. Uh, but they're going back in the same vein, they're following the rise of uh, Caesar, the first ape, to, to say no in the original series, uh, which I think is a neat idea for them to approach instead of starting with the end and then you know going backwards they're, they're yeah. starting the beginning with this it's like when they finally get around to remaking star wars in 100 years will they start with phantom menace 
That's oh my god, I hope not. Uh, and finally, the last one doesn't have a release date yet, uh, but they mentioned The Divide. Xavier Jens follows up his remarkably bloody horror debut Frontier with a more mainstream yet less memorable video game adaptation, uh, Hitman. His next movie, meanwhile, sees Jens change genres once again with the post-apocalyptic sci-fi The Divide featuring Michael Bain, Peter Stormar, Roseanne Arquette, and Milo Ventimiglia. Uh, it sees New York obliterated by an unspecified apocalyptic event. I'm in. Apocalyptic event. Uh, let me tell you, this looks like a really good year for sci-fi. I mean, how many years do we even get 10 movies of this quality? Or at least sound, you know, we don't know until we see them. But, I mean, I'm super excited. And they're all vastly different from one another. You've got some over-the-top action. You've got, um, you know, uh, this, this, this period piece with Super 8. You've got the found footage with uh, uh, Apollo 18. I mean, this is a good year for sci-fi. And The Hobbit finally started shooting two days ago. We already talked about this. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm okay excited about The Hobbit, but what does it say about the beleaguered state of the movie that on day one of production, uh, they instantly feel the need to put out photos and be like, look, it's happening for reals. I'm on a set. I couldn't have the set if it wouldn't, we're really making the movies. I don't think that means that it's like going to be bad or anything, no, but no, I think after doesn't. all of the lawsuits and delays, that I think they did one. They took a lot of, I can understand taking a lot of joy and saying, we finally did it. We actually yeah. started shooting the freaking movie. It's like, it's like when you are, you know, arrive in Indonesia on your big trip and you posted your first photo up on Twitter because you got there, you finally made it. Well, I didn't have half the troubles getting there that the no. Hobbits had. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Getting, getting, hey, did you ever see, what was that documentary about uh, the Man of La Mancha movie and its complete implosion, the Terry Gilliam project? Do you, do you remember hearing I about that? I vaguely remember that, but I can't remember the name of the freaking documentary. Oh, man, I yeah, can't we'll, remember we'll the name it. of that. I never saw the documentary, but the story was just so legendary of, of all the disasters that happened on, on that movie. I'm Although, cool. does it part of you knowing Terry, Terry Gilliam, uh, who anybody that doesn't know, he was the American in Monty Python, the guy who did all the animations. You didn't really see him talk. Uh, knowing Terry Gilliam, does not part of you think, well, wait a minute, Man of La Mancha, tilting at windmills, never achieving, and then... He pretends like he tried to make this movie and then he's tilting at windmills and he never... Oh, no, that would be too ambitious. I don't know. That would be too meta. That would be... Uh, I, I don't little, believe that. would a little awesome. suspicious of that. I don't believe it, but that would be awesome. Hey, did you watch any movies this week? No, I did not. Saw Paul last night. How uh, is Paul? Uh, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost. Uh, it was great, actually. I... I mean, it was great for what it was, and I had low expectations. I just wanted to have a good time. Uh, the jokes come with so much frequency, that, that, and they're so deeply embedded. Like, there's geeks, geeks jokes in there. Like, at one point, and you knew it was intentional, some uh, car goes over a cliff, and you could barely hear very distinctly the Wilhelm scream as he goes down. <laughs> all, these, all these individual things. I mean, I, I and, you know... Stuff, stuff where it's like if you if you're not as embedded in geek culture as as we are, then you're still gonna enjoy the movie. You're not gonna catch them all, but you're like, oh, that was very deliberate that they're referencing Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and they and they set up a plot device to where it's not silly that they're doing these things. And I don't want to say exactly what it is, but I right. enjoyed it immensely. Kenny D says Lost in La Mancha is the name of the documentary. Lost in La Mancha. Okay, yeah. I'm going to see if that's up on Netflix, and, uh, and I'll probably watch that on instant streaming. On to the tops of the tubes. <laughs> I find it hilarious that our film film intro is like five minutes long, and our tube tops is like two seconds. We're going to fix that. We'll get Don to say, frame rate, coming up after your local news and Nightline, <laughs> and then we'll play the special thing. I guess it makes sense, though. Uh, yeah. Television is short attention span, and exactly. film is like sit back and you enjoy. you got 22 minutes on TV. you got By an hour line, and a half on film. Your so. on needs to be exactly half a second long That's in right. its intro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the, uh, the big Netflix House of Cards deal did go down. Uh, Netflix announced uh, or late, or I guess it was March 18th, uh, so just four days ago that it got the show after rumors spread earlier in the week that their deal was nearing completion. So, yes, absolutely going to see original programming coming straight to Netflix, including Canada, U.S. Well, and Canada uh, in late 2012. You know what else went down? Netflix's website. It's full on. You can't stream anything at this moment. You can't 
shop for DVDs. You can't pick your, your cues or nothing. Uh, the chat room's been howling about this for the last yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah, I know. I saw the chat room howling. As websites go down. I don't know. Am I just jaded? Like, when Apple goes down and everybody gets to say, oh, they're going to have a new brand. When Amazon goes down, when Facebook goes down, I'm like, Twitter's down. I'm just like, yeah, websites go down. Like, did it go down for an interesting reason? Then maybe it's a story to me. But just the fact that it's down, like, by the time someone watches this episode of Frame Rate as a podcast, it'll probably be back up. Right. Well, here's what it is, is the type of people who are surprised by this are the type of people who have been so accustomed for the last, you know, decade or three of broadcast television being always on and never having a problem where it shut down from time to time. Now, I remember in the early 80s, you, 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 mean you never had cable. Yeah, especially local television. All of a sudden, everything would crap out. And yeah, you just right. Have it out. And, you know, now you're just looking at a sunshine for 20 minutes. And oh, then totally. It, Remember the, the big Heidi thing where, like, the last few minutes of the tight football game disappeared oh my gosh. because they went to yes. the special presentation of Heidi? Yes, yes, right in the middle. And if you actually watch it, it's like the, the football's going through the air. It's the end of the freaking game. And it just snaps to a little girl running in a field. Uh, stuff like that used to happen all the time. And I think people, uh, especially the generation who's into new media, are not accustomed to, you know, they want everything available all the time and, and on. And uh, so it's, it's <laughs> See, that's them. the part that puzzles me. Because it's like, if you're really into new media, then you've used a website before. Which means you've had it give you problems. You've had websites not load for one reason or another. Well, but, but again, I'm not going to harp on them because one of the things we talk about a lot on frame rate is how new media is pushing out, you know, new hotness is pushing out old and busted. But when new hotness starts acting like old and busted, then that, I mean, that's significant because if, if we're saying cut the cord, get rid of your cable, Netflix is the way to go, uh, then, you know, th then it certainly matters that anyone yeah, doing that but you know what i guess it's the statistical part of it I, 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 there's just a real gut reaction to me is like this is not interesting yes it's down right now how long is it down for a day then i'll start to pay attention down for a couple days that's big news down for an hour out of the like hundreds of thousands of hours it's probably still got better uptime than your cable television does because right. a storm came through and knocked it out or you lost power or you know or or your direct tv satellite got blown off the roof like it's still it's like for some reason everybody just thinks it's news because something big went down i i'm just i get off my lawn <laughs> you can't with your jazz music get out of here <laughs> you beatniks you're tearing up society all right, uh, you uh, have something that is not down. Your uh, Time Warner cable app finally started working. Yeah, you remember I was harping on them, not for the fact that um, uh, not for the fact that the app uh, required you to watch from home, but the fact that I was at home on my home network and out of the box, the thing wasn't working. Um, and luckily, I, I never downloaded an update or anything, but whatever it was on their end totally just fixed itself because now, uh, let me turn this over here, uh, just out of nowhere... I okay, that was what we had last week, was just yeah, the Time Warner thing. Now you've got a thing. It's, yeah, oh, look at that. Fun. I actually see um, uh, uh, Gergen from CNN. I like yeah. him. He's smart. Uh, it, it, the, the response is fast. The picture quality is excellent. I could totally see hanging, you know, you're in the bathtub, just set this up, watch your, your news yeah, or whatever. Yeah, you get the cover, and then you can just hang it on the wall with the magazine. There you go. If you're the type of person that's obsessed with watching stuff live, the problem is, is Outside of the news channels and maybe the sports stuff, but I mean, I'm not even into sports so much, but, but outside of stuff that, that live matters, I just can't see when I'm going to use this because it's like I'm not going to tune in on AMC to watch Madman on it because I'm going to make sure that it's DVR, so I'm not watching commercials. Yeah, it seems so, like live events, you're right. Again, totally. again, uh, step in the right direction. I'm glad they're doing it, and it certainly I'm glad it works. Uh, Venture Brothers renewed for not one, but two more seasons. Fantastic news. Very excited about that. Have you heard of shows? I, I can't remember the last time I heard of a show getting picked up for multiple seasons at once. Glee. I mean, I guess. Uh, oh, Glee did? Yep. And uh, Battlestar Galactica, I think, did as well. At they one didn't point, yep. yep. Uh, Lost uh, got guaranteed through six seasons at, at like okay. season four, three or four. I can't remember. Uh, well, congrats to the whole team over there uh, doing Venture Brothers. That show is so good. That's, in fact, uh, talking about what we're watching. Uh, I, I am plowing through season two. I'm not quite to the final episode. I know everyone talks about how good the final episode is. It's I said season two. Yeah. We're on season four. Uh, and uh, it's so good. The show is so good, and it just doesn't wait for you. It sets up a joke and just keeps running, and then it'll, the joke will be like, oh, yeah, that joke that you didn't understand the whole show? In the last, like, three seconds of it, they'll be like, that's what that joke was. And it's, uh, love it. Good for those guys.
Yeah, no, they are they are brilliant, and and they're tied in specifically to our cultural sensibility. I don't know if it's our generation or just our our niche, uh, but they 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 plug into mine. And Jammerby here is a big fan, and I know you are now a big fan. And Veronica Belmont is a big fan. It's just all of us are like, yes, I get that. I get what they're parodying. I get these jokes. There's layers upon layers. You can watch the shows two or three times and still discover allusions that you missed the first time through. It's amazing. Love that show. Absolutely. Sci-Fi cool. unveils its largest original programming lineup in history. We were talking about them earlier, how they're widening out. Let's look and find out how far they are widening. Alphas will premiere in July, follows a team of ordinary citizens whose brain anomalies imbue them with extraordinary mental and physical abilities. Kind of a superhero story. This isn't too far afield for them, right? No, no, no. And look, uh, most of the content that they create in-house is very much sci-fi. What you seem to object to is the fact that they're showing wrestling on Friday or Saturday nights. Well, they've, they've got wrestling now on, on Tuesday and Friday nights. They kicked all of their show, most of their shows off Friday so that they could get WWF Friday SmackDown. Uh, and they're also doing things like, um, the, what's the show where, you, where they, they're following around auctions of movie props? That's vaguely... It's very tangentially related. Uh, Marcel's Quantum Kitchen premieres tonight, uh, which is, you know, kind of more of a food channel tech meets tech show. I'm trying so hard to defend them. This is not working out. <laughs> yeah. Try. But Alpha sounds all right. That that sounds like uh, like something okay. Haunted Collector premieres in June. Ghosts and spirits inhabit more than just homes and buildings. This is in their ghost hunter vein, which is also right. very tangential to sci-fi. Uh, John Zaffis and his family are renowned paranormal investigators, so it's a reality thing. Legend Quest, another reality series in July. A fast-paced action adventure follows Ashley Cowie, a real-life symbologist, as he travels the world in search of some of history's greatest relics. History. Channel. You know, I I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm glancing through this list right now, and what I'm most excited about are the Saturday original movies. Titles only. You 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 want to hear this? Uh, sure, Red, sure, yeah, yeah. Red Faction Origins, uh, which I assume is uh, based on the the video game franchise. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, Zombie Apocalypse. Working yes. Type. Done. In. Gretel. Watching. Uh, Snow Mageddon. Yes. See? It's a mystical snow globe that makes very bad things happen in the real world when it's shaken. Awesome. Uh, Bigfoot, St. Patrick's Day, Le Leprechaun, Roswell, my favorite, Jersey Shore t Shark Attack. Nice. Is called. This is going to be some kind of, of, of... At some point, someone in that uh, movie has to say, the situation is serious. <laughs> and then immediately get gobbled in half, just yes. bitten in half with his rock hard abs glistening in the sun, covered in his own blood. Uh, also, uh, Battlestar Blood and Chrome coming. coming. Uh, this is they, they gave up on Caprica, so now they're doing uh, a, a closer prequel, which takes place in the 10th year of the first Cylon War. Uh, yeah, way excited. Do we have a date on that one, by the way? Uh, it does not give a date in this press release. The, the official release date is not soon enough. Yes, exactly. Uh, then there's more script. There's more stuff in development. Once you get into the development part, uh, that's where you see some really crazy stuff like Culture Shock with Tommy Lee. That's been in development on their press release for a couple of years now. Uh, Monster Man, Stunts Unlimited, High Tech Hoaxes. Uh, as you as you can tell, they're they're getting they're broadening out into tech. They're broadening out into ghosts. They're you know they're they're. They're getting looser, and we're not going to see as many like Battlestar Galacticas as we used to. It doesn't sound like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's a broad prediction. You never know. I mean, if 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 Blood and Chrome nails it, then they, you know, then all of a sudden they got lightning in a bottle again. They can make. I'm that sorry. Out. They just canceled Caprica and Stargate Universe and renewed Warehouse 13, and still have the Tommy Lee Show in development. All right. Uh, again, again, I'm not so good Touché. at defending sci fi apparently. <laughs> Uh, uh, Songs of Ice and Fire, uh, the the Game of Thrones series on HBO is coming soon. I think it's what April twelfth, uh, uh, but they April nineteenth or so. April nineteenth, maybe, maybe you you may be right about that. Uh, but they are unleashing a torrent of online atmospheres. They've been doing like soundscapes and puzzles, and now like tons of videos with behind the scenes and and pictures of what's going on. You can almost piece together the whole first episode just watching all these I, trailers. To be honest, as great as these games are and, and these this ability to unlock content, 
uh, having read the book, I don't want to sit here and overthink it. I want to be, this is what I love about watching movies that are based on stories I'm already familiar with, is all these half-forgotten elements that pop back in. And you're like, oh, I totally remember that. And if I go through all of this extra content, I'm going to be revisiting all this I, I I want to get as close to experiencing it fresh as all I right, possible. All right, so you don't want to watch the uh, the Taiwanese animation uh, news coverage of uh, George oh, yeah, R. R. No, Martin. This, this no lie it says George R R Martin fantasy blue baller is what this is called. Oh. <laughs> HBO决定把第一册拍成电视影集 第一集将会在4月17号 <笑> So I, for all, poor audio listeners are hearing nothing but the, the foreign language. But Many I just want them to point speak out Chinese. How clever, how clever all this stuff is. First of all, look at the stuff that's written on the wall uh, of his, uh, of, I guess he's trying to decide what the plot points are. In his castle. Like, like it says here, puppy fetus. <laughs> and I don't know what that means. Or the idea of King Tyrion. Who uh, dies next? Uh, you know, who is Jon Snow and all this stuff. And then later, so it's about how all the fans are so upset that it's taken five years to finish these books. And more importantly, he's, he's said that if he dies before it's completed, he will have all of his notes burned. And so, and so it shows an animation of him dying and his ghost laughing at everyone and dancing. <laughs> like the dancing baby. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... And again, in the protests, in the, in, the, in the protests, you've got all these people with signs. And if you've read the series, it's so Hodor, funny. Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. Exactly. It says Hodor, the Hodor. And, uh, of course, on his blog, he just talks about football all the time. And so people have signs that say fantasy, not football. Uh, you'll be able to find all that stuff in the notes for the show. But uh, this, I love these animations, man. And whoever's making them is really oh, hip to some clever ideas. Now but you that, did. Uh, I I really haven't been watching all that much television either. I, I've I've just been recovering from all of my uh, my my travels uh, recently. I've watched a little bit of Being Human, but uh, we, you talked about catching up on Venture Brothers. You're also watching Boardwalk Empire, right? Yeah, and you know what? Darned it for the first time. I didn't finish one and be all like, well, now I kind of want to know what happens next. I'm about uh, six episodes into the first season, and I I'm. Uh, look, man, you're talking to a guy who hated the first season and a half of The Wire and finally got into it. And I, I, I think maybe Boardwalk Empire, it's got its own rhythm and it's a little bit slower and different from what I'm it used is, to. It is, it is. And I, I'd have to say about six to eight, episode six to eight is where I started to actually wonder what was going to happen next instead of dying for something to happen next. But it wasn't right. enough to make me want to watch it. So I haven't. I think I might be there, but uh, yeah. All right. Let's move on and finish up with some interferon to stop the virus or the viral video. Now, when we were talking about the BitTorrent release of Tunnels earlier, we got a little confused because there's another BitTorrent release, but this is not from a major motion picture studio like Paramount. This was crowdfunded. Uh, and the film is called Zenith, now available for a free BitTorrent download. Yes, and it looks like it's going to be episodic and that it's going to be something that anybody can contribute to. And again, we've talked about this before. Just as the Internet has made possible the life of the middle-class rock star, now you could be uh, middle-class investors, film investors, you know, and, and or producers um, I, I again, great experiment. I hope I hope it's good. Uh, I guess the first episode's out. I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? I haven't watched it yet. No, like I said, I've just I haven't been watching. You know what I've been doing? I've been listening to the audiobook for The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss. And what that, is that? That's it's the second book in the King Killer Chronicles. Uh, and it he's like the George R. R. Martin of our generation, and so I can't put it down. So it, wow. in, in all honesty, I say like, yeah, I've been recovering from my traveling and stuff. And part of that is true. But all of my free time, I have been listening to that audiobook. I'm just, I'm just like, if we had, if had a it. sponsor who was, you know, into audio content, this would be a great time to, to, to talk and drop a plug. But we uh, don't. But so oh. we should recommend, 
Yeah. So it's but, but, we'll uh, say, watch, watch Zenith. Zenith or Pioneer One is another uh, like well done independent BitTorrent released uh, series, and their uh, third episode is being released on March 28th. So I'm going to say that you and I should promise to do our best to watch one of those so we can report in on it. But just in case we can't, make sure to send us an email at frameratereshow at gmail.com if you've seen one of those and let us know what you think. Uh, finally, in Interferon, we must uh, just talk about the strange tale of Rebecca Black. Is she still yeah. trending worldwide? Yes, she is still trending worldwide. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, don't. But she did a song <laughs> called Friday, and the lyrics are like the kind of lyrics you might have written when you were her age, so it's understandable, but usually not made into a worldwide hit. Uh, things like yesterday was Thursday, tomorrow is Saturday, after that is Sunday. Not kidding. Don't, 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 don't do that to them. Don't turn it's, up the it's music. No! <laughs> I think my co-host Evil just about Jason young nailed it when he said it's an entire... It's an entire video whose success is predicated entirely on uh, on the lulls. Like this was, this was out of the box. So bad it's good. Can't stop watching it. Hate it so much until you end up with it stuck in your head because yeah. it's also a bit of an earworm. You yeah. get stuck there right well, now. Because the tune isn't awful. The tune is not the worst thing ever created. It's not great. But it right. is that kind of like formula pop that sticks in your sure. head. And then, sure. the, but the lyrics are just hilariously mundane. You know, well, should I get in the front seat or the back seat? That kind of stuff. And and, I think and it's so it's led itself to great parodies. Well, and I think it's the fact that uh, everything else about the video is so competent. It's a competent pop pop song. That, you know, you he, she sounds very auto tuned -y. It's, uh Even though it was done for a nothing budget, it looks like, you know, looks like, uh, you know, reasonably produced video or whatever. But then it's that moment when you actually listen to the words and they're so... Uh, I, I, I don't want to talk about bad about some poor girl because I don't even know who wrote it. But uh, but they're just so brain dead. They're just like, they, to be honest, they, they're legitimately what a thirteen year old thinks on Friday <laughs> is what I would imagine. Partying, front seat, back partying. seat, front seat, back seat. I fun, don't know. Fun, fun. Uh, yeah. So I I think it's it's just the hilariousness of it, and then the and then that tension that you're talking about has made the parodies that much funnier. Because it's like, well, if, if, a, if a fluffy pop song can have that effect on me where I don't really realize what's going on until I listen close, what if I did it as death metal? What if I did it as like a goth poem? And, and, and the list goes on. That's the one I wanted to find was the, the one where the guys, it's the visuals. First of and all, it's all like, piano music. Yeah. And the visuals are all him alone drinking himself to death on a Friday night. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it, it's it's one of those big ones like Charlie Sheen that's gonna go in the year end like remember back in March the Friday Friday meme you know like that's that's gonna be when somebody makes that internet compilation where they talk about all the memes of you know the past few years this one this one's gonna be in there Rebecca Black congratulations your 2011's keyboard cat you just won the internet. Hey uh so uh, yeah, let's talk let's talk some feedback. Let's do, actually. Uh, now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frito. Oh, yeah. yeah. What happened to our audio there? It froze for a second. Freaking laptop. Yeah. You know what? I find that insulting that this laptop interrupted that fine feedback yeah. video created by Kuhan. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I would like to give Kuhan a chance to respond. Hold on. <laughs> See, the by playing is the video playing. off that same laptop that I just <laughs> insulted. That's the that was your mistake, bro. This is my this is our first video response that we've ever gotten. Yeah, it's case, not planned. Oh, on, check this out. There. Hey, Tom and Brian. Now, as you can clearly see, I am in a high school hallway. Except I'm clearly not because you don't hear any high school sound and barely any echo. And you're missing something. But it does get the point across that I'm going to talk about high school students. Now, last episode, Tom was saying that high school students would want to see pictures in, you know, the big screen on their nice high-definition television, and they wouldn't want to watch it in a small little window on Facebook. But I'm here to tell you, Tom Merritt, you're wrong. What? You see, me being, well, technically still a high school student. See, my student ID says 2011. That means that most of my friends are also high school students. Now, being high school students, all of my friends 
are on Facebook. Now clearly, the target demographic that Facebook's trying to reach with their social streaming service are high school students like myself, maybe up to college students. Now, I have a few bits of evidence that show that high school students really could care less about the quality of this video. Uh -oh, now take, evidence. for example, this call with my friend, let's call him Nader, because that's his name. Hey, I changed the settings on your TV. Why? This looks stupid. <laughs> There's boxes on the side. Now, I know you're saying, hey, Kuan, that doesn't actually have much to do with the size of the picture as much as it has to do with the aspect ratio and the squishing. However, it does show the general attitude of a high school student towards quality. Now, I have this other audio conversation that I had with my friend, let's call him Greg, because that, that's his name. I can't tell the difference between VHS and Blu-ray. Now, if you listened very closely, you heard Greg say that he couldn't tell the difference between VHS and Blu-ray. Let me, let me show you a quick comparison here. VHS, Blu-ray. Now, later on, Greg did note that he was exaggerating. He can, in fact, tell the difference between VHS and Blu-ray. He just doesn't care. And honestly, neither do most other people. Now, I, a fan of frame rate, high definition content, and technology in general, pains me to watch me on television. Almost take personal offense to this. But it does show the attitude of the target Facebook streamer towards high definition content in general. So that's my little video about Facebook streaming content. I hope you guys took something away from it. And now I have two videos in the frame rate feedback segment. So I have to get to class because I'm really trying to sell this bit. Well done, Kuhan. Well played. Well played. God, that was stupid. Although next time, just just. Tighten, just a little, just tighten. Yeah, yeah just to take out seconds. the breaths, take out the breaths. But no, well, uh, well played, although I find a flaw in his logic, as you might have What's that? Well, yeah, what does he say at the end? I actually want the high definition picture. So he is an example of why I am right. But he's he also. He himself. It's, it's a skewed sample. The type of people who are here are people who aren't the people who just watched. I think this still leaves the question unresolved, Brian. But you know what? Let's read a quick email from Aaron C., who writes, You were talking about TiVo versus Netflix on last week's frame rate and commenting on how Netflix took off and TiVo never really did. The reason you mentioned was that it didn't integrate with cable and people didn't want another box. The other is that it requires a monthly subscription and the box is quite expensive. I thought it was $200 plus when I looked, but even right now, they're still asking for $19.99 a month plus $99 for the box on top of your cable subscription and Netflix subscription. A cable box, box rental is something like $5 yeah. a month, if not free. So no. that's, uh, financials definitely play a uh, part in it. Well played, uh, Aaron. Uh, also, well, I took your challenge and watched a random Netflix no. instant movie no. all the way. No. Jeffrey Needles says, hey, I'm 19, but remember... I got the and I have Dumb. to agree with Tom about quality when referring to myself and sadly only a few of my friends. The majority of them are all, like Brian said, unconcerned with quality. I believe that at this point in this day and age, there is not a reason for DVD quality, let alone bootleg or junky mega video stuff. Yet whenever I say I ordered a Blu-ray or want to wait for quality, I am politely mocked. I happen to only buy Blu-ray, and when I do, they go straight on to my 11-terabyte media server in my basement, which streams to my HTPC hooked up to my 42-inch in my room with full 5.1 Mirage speakers. At school, though, I am not so fortunate, but I still maintain a 7-terabyte HTPC full of 1080p goodness. I have both Netflix and Hulu Plus 2 on a Roku at home and via Vizio apps on my TV at school, but that is usually only used on my laptop as a second scenario when I cannot find a podcast to watch while using the TV. TV for Xbox 360. Once again, kid, we have direct kid. evidence from Jeffrey and Kuhan that I am what Tom is talking about. We only have this sort of tertiary, flimsy evidence of the so-called silent majority that you don't you care. You cannot tell me. You cannot tell me that Jeffrey's anything like the majority of teenagers out there with seven Let's terabytes say of that two quality. out of the two people who responded themselves described themselves as the kind of person I'm talking about. Apparently, I'm also not so good at picking the emails. <laughs> the ones that I think are supporting my position clearly are being perverted to support your position. But if you guys want to chime in, hit us up at frameratio at gmail.com. Uh, like, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm out. You, you got anything else, Tom? Yep, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will see you next time on Frame Rate. Oh. Uh, oh, that was a really quick out. Perfect.